All right, peace be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Hussam. I am the Research and Outreach Coordinator Officer at the Washington Center for Yemeni Studies, a center whose vision is to be one of the main sources and references for researchers and those interested in Yemeni affairs and to provide wider support for the democratic process. Today, we are presenting a webinar discussing the significance of the revolution that occurred on the 26th of September, 1962. That was a turning point in Yemeni lives. In the name of Allah and in the name of the people, the army's leadership declares the fall of the monarchy in Yemen and the establishment of the Yemeni Arabic Republic as of the fifth, as of five in the evening of the 27th of Rabi Athani of the year, 1383, that's lunar calendar, September 26th of 1962. This was the declaration that was announced on the Yemeni radio. This was the revolution and the six goals of which were freedom from tyranny and colonialism and the remnants and the establishment of a just Republican uh, rule, the, the prevention of differences in privileges between classes, that's one. The second, out of the six was building a strong national army to protect the country and guard the revolution and its gains. The third goal was raising the development of the people economically, socially, politically, and culturally. The fourth goal was establishing a just, cooperative, democratic society whose systems are derived from the spirit of Islam. The fifth, working to achieve national unity within the scope of a comprehensive Arab unity. The sixth, respecting the international charters of the United Nations, adhering to the principles of positive neutrality and grouping, working to establish, to establish world peace and strengthening the principle of peaceful coexistence among nations. The revolution in this day and this announcement marked the beginning of an eight year multi-layered war, much like today's with local, regional and international players. The battle for dominance, which ended in 1970 with the formation of a reconciliatory government. With that being said, I would like to welcome our speakers, Dr. G.E. Peterson, Dr. Asher Orkabi, who's a descendant of Yemenis, I just found out. His name is Ashraf Orkabi, Min Rada' in Yemen, and Miss Nadwa Dosari. Thank you all for taking the time and being with us today. Just before we start, some housekeeping rules. Today's sessions will be entirely in English. However, like we always do, we will send an email to other participants with a report in both languages summarizing the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat or in the comment section of Facebook and we will forward them and hopefully get to ask as many as we possibly can. And now without further ado, we welcome our first speaker, Dr. G.E. Peterson. Dr. Peterson is a historian and a political analyst specializing in the Arabian Peninsula and Gulf. And on the anniversary of the revolution, he will share with us some of the most important events of September 26th, the revolution. Dr. Peterson, you have the mic. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my first event with the Washington Center for Yemeni Studies, and it's always uh, worthwhile as well as a pleasure to have Yemen discussed in this country because it's far too often neglected and particularly under the, the horrible circumstances of today. I think it's hard, very hard to remember what the impact of the revolution was in 1962 uh, because so many things have happened since then. Ostensibly overnight, a traditional, even reactionary form of government was overthrown and a new promise of republicanism entered. The impact was lost for approximately eight years because of all the fighting. And the state that emerged after that was also hobbled by many different problems. There, yes, there was a commitment, certainly in rhetoric, to um, joining the international community of creating citizens of all Yemenis being citizens of a country, of a central government that was committed to 
producing change, to improve the life of people, to improve the equality between Yemenis. Um, but over the years, this impact, um, the, the promise of the revolution was in many ways offset by an actuality that was not quite so positive. Um, yes, Yemen joined the community of Arab states and put an, long, an end to its long isolation, but it also developed from this Republican ideal into a military-led government, which eventually became extremely authoritarian. And this reflects in many ways the, the history of the progressive Arab states, which all became authoritarian as much as the uh, Arab monarchies were and are. The, the extent of change to the people of Yemen was also restricted, partly because of the poverty, this, even though a central government had expressed its commitment to socioeconomic development, it did not have the means to do so. Um, it was unable to impose taxation in order to get that uh, financial benefit. And therefore it was difficult to offer any kind of social services beyond um, the cities. Um, and of course, it faced a problem, a very widespread problem throughout the Arab world, throughout the third world, in which resources were siphoned off by corruption and not, uh, and a government that was re that was committed to principles, in fact, became something of a kleptocracy. Educational social progress was stunted because of this. Um, did the Republic of Yemen, when established in 1990, was it the rightful heir to the 26th of September revolution? In the first place, the joining, the South joining the North was an act of desperation and it was quickly swept aside in the domination by the North. The government did not change. That is the leadership was Ali Abdullah Saleh who ruled the country almost single-handedly or in coalition with his patronage network. And it really did not produce the kinds of results that, that um, those who carried out that September 26th revolution intended. Um, actually, I think I'm gonna leave it there. I was going to make a remark or two on the war, present war and its relationship, but we'll do that later, I understand. Thank you. You're muted. I noticed. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Dr. Peterson. Um, so, Thank you for the quick introduction. And now we will move on to the next point, which is the goals of, and achievements of the revolution. And I would like to give the mic for that to Dr. Asher Orkabi to give us a little rundown, and then we will return to these points towards the end of the webinar. Uh, shukran, uh, Hussam, and it's a real pleasure to be uh, with uh, such a distinguished group, uh, Nadwa in particular. I'm really glad we're, we're able to finally connect uh, and in, in typical academic fashion, I'll, I'll share a couple of, uh, of screens because uh, academics can't speak without uh, a few a few slides. Um, so I'll I'll just uh, bring this um, this up here, uh, and uh, as um, as you'll see, I, I titled it in particular uh, speaking to, uh, in in response to Dr. Peterson the September twenty sixth revolution yesterday and today. Uh, because it's it's not a revolution that happens only in 1962, but it's really one whose uh, uh, both who, whose legacy and whose uh, tenets continue to reverberate through this uh, day and through certainly through the current conflict. Uh, as each member of the uh, current uh, conflict in Yemen tries to uh, take hold of the revolution and make it its own and use it for its own purposes. As uh, I'm sure we'll see in September 26, as each group tries to create its own celebration of the revolution. 
Uh, and just to it bring us back up in terms of where all this started, and this is important to understand this distinction. So on paper, uh, this was really a, a war between uh, the royalists, uh, Muhammad al-Badr, who uh, was, uh, as, as many, many of you know, uh, in, uh, uh, was really an Arab nationalist. And, and the fact that he ends up uh, as, as a counter-revolutionary is only a happenstance of history because he uh, his palace is shelved and nobody really knows if he's alive or not. By the time uh, the dust clears, the metaphorical dust clears, he's already in Saudi Arabia and there's the Yemen Arab Republic declared and he's in the opposition. Uh, so it's a circumstance of history, but uh, the important part that uh, I think we should we need to uh, take out is that is that the Yemen Arab Republic on the other side, with Abdullah Salal is your is your central uh, focus, but uh, really it, historical memory sees the Yemen uh, war during the 1960s after the revolution is one that was really between Saudi Arabia and Egypt, uh, taking a lot of the historical agency away from the Yemenis uh, and certainly away from. Uh, from the uh, Yemenis who founded the Republic in itself and the Republicans. And so what I argue in a lot of my writing, and I think is an important legacy of the September 26th revolution, is the, the famous 40. So uh, the Arba'in al-Mashhurin, the famous 40, the 40 central students who study abroad, uh, Imam Yahya uh, originally sends them abroad uh, to study in uh, the rest of the, in, in Baghdad and uh, in El Qahira and Cairo and Europe and even in the United States, uh, some of the more famous individuals within Yemeni society, many of which we know, uh, who take a, a very central role in this revolution. They come back to, to Yemen with a lot of new modern ideas and seek ways to implement it. And uh, this manifestation of the famous 40, and it really wasn't just famous 40, it was hundreds of others who followed with a, a chain study abroad migration. And we think study abroad and, and many uh, Yemeni studying abroad uh, and uh, gaining expertise uh, can, can certainly understand this. Uh, there are hundreds of others and you have networks of Yemenis because uh, when you're studying abroad, you need to make sure you have your uh, Yemeni coffee when you're studying abroad, your uh, Gat Sahri, and you need to have your Yemeni group because you can't, uh, uh, you, you can't uh, function with that, that camaraderie. So the famous 40 come back uh, with hundreds of other Yemenis who are educated abroad to bring a new modern era uh, to Yemen and to bring this republic to Yemen, to overthrow the uh, the old monarchy uh, and to bring uh, North Yemen, in this case, into a new era. Uh, and that's why we're celebrating September 26th today. So this, uh, f these famous 40, I think is the most important legacy of September 26th is the fact that uh, the Yemeni state was not forced into a revolution by Egypt. Uh, the revolution was not co-opted by Saudi Arabia, but this was really a Yemeni revolution, one that was uh, directed by Yemenis, uh, one that was controlled by uh, Yemenis and, and, and inspired by them, and specifically in the, uh, in, in the identity of the famous 40, uh, who came in not only to lead the revolution, but then to serve as its civil servants. Many of its political leaders come from this uh, same group. Uh, and... Uh, and come then afterwards to, to lead the country over the subsequent decades. Uh, and the important um, legacy as well is that uh, one of the, the last, uh, the famous 40 really die off by the time uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh is overthrown in 2012, the last members of the original generation of revolutionaries, the original famous 40 have all died off, which means that the first revolutionary generation of Yemen have died off. And here we are, uh, second generation, Nagwa, myself, many of the others in this room, uh, are this next generation of revolutionaries. It's it's now our responsibility to then see it forward. But uh, where does this revolutionary uh, legacy go wrong? And part of the challenge, and, and uh, Dr. Peterson mentioned this, is that the revolution occurs not in Yemen as we know it today, the unified Yemen, but really in Sana'a itself. And in the surrounding, uh, what emerges is the Yemeni Arab Republic or North Yemen, uh, but never really accounts for the two other areas within Yemen, both the, the southern Yemen uh, becomes the Marxist state, and even in Hadramaut in the east, which has a very separate identity. Hadramis pride themselves. Uh, many of my greatest friends, Hadramis, have said, well, we're, we're Yemenis, but we're really Hadramis. We're one step ahead of everyone else because we're, uh, we have a great degree of autonomy. The revolution, especially after 1990, this tenets of the revolution, what it meant to be Yemenis, was forced in some ways, uh, unsuccessfully, as Dr. Peterson said, on uh, the southern and eastern populations, 
to uh, and we see the, the lack of success really was manifested in the, in the current conflict, where this idea of what a Yemeni republic means has lost a lot of its uh, credence and certainly lost a lot of its legitimacy in defending the state. And part of that is, uh, is really, if you look at the origins of what happens then after the revolution, uh, the revolution is the defeat of, of many of the northern uh, tribesmen around, tribes around uh, the area of Saada, uh, many of those who had sworn allegiance to the deposed Imam Muhammad al-Badr after uh, the siege of 1967-68, uh, when the uh, counter-revolutionary forces are forced out of politics uh, and there's um, uh, Iriani comes in and, and, and stages some kind of uh, coalition, uh, but nevertheless, there's still a, a great degree of, uh, of uh, priority given to Sana'a and certainly the areas around it. Uh, most of the development that happens under the post-revolutionary years happens around the central areas of the country. And, and this was just one very stark uh, image that, that I had uh, was if you look at where the oil refineries are in particular, and uh, then you can see a similar map of uh, where the electrification of the company, country happens. It it's all happens around Sama and it's, it's surrounding areas, uh, leading to a, a great deal of, of disconnect between uh, the northern half of the country and, and certainly the central half of the country, uh, creating a great challenge to this revolutionary legacy. What does September 26th mean for a population that feels disenchanted from, from the central government in Sama, the failure of the central government to incorporate the periphery areas. And th this was similarly uh, the case with the three uh, border regions uh, that uh, are uh, border, they, they were Yemeni, Asir, Najran, and Jizan prior to uh, 1934, uh, and they're now Saudi uh, in nationality, but Yemeni in identity. And a lot of the movements that, that had driven Yemeni nationalism uh, one of the most vocal movements, certainly in the North, is Asir movement, is the revolution uh, in its first tenets was going to take back these, these old territories and bring back Yemeni nationalism. But how one defines Yemeni nationalism has been one of the greatest challenges for uh, any Yemeni state after the revolution. What does this revolution, what does the legacy mean for the rest of, uh, what does the legacy mean for the rest of uh, the uh, decades after 1962, and, and that's been the greatest challenge. And uh, today we're faced with a very similar challenge in Yemen, uh, where in the 1960s, it was all about Saudi Arabia and Egypt and their efforts to overthrow and bring the downfall or, or take over uh, Yemen in some ways uh, and, and force uh, their own uh, political legitimacy upon Yemen. And today Yemen is faced with a very similar challenge of uh, the world seeing Yemen not as Yemenis, but as some kind of division between two global powers. It's no longer about the Yemeni revolution, it's no longer about the Yemeni state, uh, but it's really about a broader regional war. And again, just as it did during the 1960s, uh, the, the world uh, global media is taking away that legitimacy and that autonomy and agency from Yemenis. So I leave us with a question then, if we're thinking about the legacy, and as I said, the legacy of the Yemen revolution was all about the famous 40. Now the famous 40, a concept that comes far uh, before the Fortune magazine decides to create a 40 under 40 category, uh, where the 40 leading individuals under the age of 40. Uh, so before that uh, Fortune magazine came up with this, it was really the Yemenis who had come up with the 40. So I, I leave a legacy is what legacy can we take out of uh, the, the Yemeni revolution. And the legacy that we can take out of the revolution uh, is that, in fact, uh, we need to find the new 40, a uh, famous 40. There needs to be a new generation of, uh, of al-Bari'in, al-Mashhurin, who can redefine what the revolution means for a new generation to bring those same areas that were on the periphery of the revolution, uh, to bring them into a new concept of what it means to be Yemeni. In 1962, everyone, at least who was in Sana'a, in North Yemen knew what it meant to be Yemeni. But today there's so many different uh, identities that you need a new generation of al bayin and mashhurin uh, that brings uh, Bab al Yemen and many of the uh, identity features that we see as our homeland in Yemen uh, is how does this translate into a new era of the revolution, taking the legacy of 1962 to a new generation. Shukran Jazila. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Orkabi. And I did forget to introduce you at the beginning. So his bio, 
Dr. Orkabi, again, is the son of Yemeni immigrants. He is an associate research scholar at Princeton University's Trans Regional Institute. And something that is very interesting that I found in your book is that despite the isolationism of the imam, at some point they had, I believe, a former CIA operative as a spokesperson or representing them at the United Nations, which is very interesting. And I would love for you to touch back upon that towards the end of this when we uh, start discussing the, um, the, the, the struggle for the recognition of, of the Yemeni Republic. And before I turn to our next speaker, I would like to remind everyone to send us their questions in the chat and in the comment section on Facebook. And we will try to answer as many of them as possible at the end of this. And now I would like to turn and welcome to our next speaker, Nedwa Doseri. She is a non resident fellow at the Middle East Institute and a researcher focusing on conflict and peace building. And in a recent paper published on April 2021 for the Middle East Institute, uh, Nadwa, you had a section entitled Fear of the Houthis Reviving the MMI. So we would like for you to talk about uh, the current Yemeni struggle to protect the 1962 revolution against falling back into the theocracy. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Hassam, and thank you for the Washington Center to, for um, hosting me uh, to speak in this event, um, uh, which is to celebrate a very dear uh, memory for all of us Yemenis. Um, first of all, the music that you had in the beginning brought some really fond memories I had from my childhood. I was born long ago after the revolution. But I remember that in my school, they always played this music uh, to celebrate the revolution. And I walked to school and I, hearing that music just filled me with joy and, um, you know, and pride. Uh, so to, to September 22nd, uh, when, when I was in school, it was, we talked about 20, September 26th revolution, all the time it was in the curriculum, it was in school activities. Um, so it's it's in the blood of so many of us, that generation that, uh, you know, was able to enjoy the results of the revolution, which is, you know, healthcare, schools, um, and all of the things that the, the generation before us didn't enjoy. Um, but so I want to take this opportunity to reflect on the past 60 years um, and you know how we got here. So September uh, revolution, um, you know, uh, uh, Usher and um, talked about it um, in details, but I want to say is that what happened in, in, in September, uh, in, in September to, to 2026, we overthrew the Imams and there was a counter revolution um, and revolutionaries defended um, the revolution and eventually defeated the imam forces, uh, counter-revolution forces in 86. Uh, but what happened after that was actually how things didn't really go in the direction we, the revolutionary envisioned. What happened was that uh, certain elites from the North, um, they, um, you know, who did not really defend the revolution, many of them were outside the country or fled uh, for their lives. Um, they came back, they claimed power, they eliminated the real revolutionaries, many of them um, came from Taiz and you know, other middle areas and they recycled some royalists and they hijacked the Republic. So yes, we had a Republic and yes, we had improved services, but then we uh, swapped one tyranny for another form of tyranny. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was the beginning of a pattern of corruption, power grab, and marginalization um, uh, that uh, the elite have uh, exercised on the rest of Yemenis. So it comes 1994, uh, same northern elite hijacked the newborn country, the democracy that we, we adopted. Uh, they eliminated opponents. Um, a lot of the opponents were, assass were assassinated from the Yemeni Socialist Party and other also uh, forces uh, that are opposed to the regime. Um, and then the 1994 civil war, the Northern elites and their patronage network took, 
took power, um, eliminated opponents, and, and you know basically mon monopolized power, um, and that created grievances and ex exacerbated old ones. Now comes 2011 uh, uprising, which was the result of the grievances and the corruption uh, that Yemenis had to live with for you know the previous 20 years. Um, but what happened was yes. Um, what happened, the, the revolution in 2011 was, was genuine, was youth led, uh, but then what happened was that political parties and actors who used to be Saleh allies, but now they're Saleh um, you know, opponents, um, Ali Mohsen, Hamid al-Ahmar, Islah, they captured, they hijacked the 2011 uprising. And then we ended up, instead of you know, um, overthrowing the regime, we ended up with a recycled version of the regime. Um, and it, it, it was a very corrupt government after 2011. Um, and then Saleh was still there. He allied with the Houthis um, and, you know, overthrew the government in 2014. Um, and basically, since 2015, Houthis have done a very systematic job well, they prevailed militarily to start with. Um, and that's not because they're strong or supported among the people, but that's because the government and the coalition um, are, are extremely incompetent and they had divergent agendas that ended up dividing the anti-Houthi forces, which played into the hands of the Houthis militarily. Um, but what happened over the past seven years is that the Houthis have been systematically um, uh, eliminating traces of the September 26th revolution, from not celebrating the revolution to uh, changing the school curriculum. Um, and in effect, they have revived the imamate. I mean, the Houthis is a, a political ideological group who believe in um, a theocracy where only descendants of the prophets rule. But in the case of the Houthis, it's also mixed with uh, the Iranian revolution model, which is extremely, um, also um, extremely uh, oppressive. Um, so, but what also happened is just like in 2011, 2015, we Yemenis kind of, um, we accepted the Hadi government, which is extremely corrupt, and the, the Hadi government officials live outside the country in luxury with their families. Um, they are incompetent. And um, how can you how can you win a war with that? Um, and I know the Saudis and the Emiratis have divergent agendas and that divided the anti Houthi forces, but the blame should be on Hadi's government. Why is Hadi's government living abroad? Why are they not? you know, in Yemen, struggling with the Yemenis to get rid of, of, of the Houthis or to stop this, you know, massive project that seeks to take us back 60 years. Well, no, no more than 60 years. Um, so I think we, you know, we, we overthrew the imams in 1962, um, but the core objectives of the revolution were never really achieved. Um, and that led to cycles of violence and conflict um, that emerged, you know, say, uh, 67, 68, 94, 2011, 2014, and the cycle continues. Now, 60 years later, most of the country is, and is living under an imamate role, the Houthis. Only we're now 25 more million people, and we have too many outside actors also involved. Uh, through their proxies and directly. Um, and I think the one reflection I have is that we Yemenis sometimes choose to forgive corruption and accept recycling of the corrupt uh, and elite. Um, you know, we accepted corrupt elite to get rid of the imams. Um, and then now we also we accepted the corrupt opposition taking over the 2011 uprising because we wanted to get rid of Saleh. And then we accepted Hadi's government with all its flaws um, because we are afraid that the alternative is the Houthis. 
well, it doesn't have to be the Houthis and it shouldn't be. And I think it's time to break the cycle of, um, you know, um, accepting these patterns. It, it's, it's time to demand what we Yemenis deserve um, and, and refuse to accept corrupt politicians to take charge of our affairs and, and take things into our hands. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I just I just wanted to share these reflections, and you know, it's it's tragic. Sixty years after the revolution, and with all the sacrifices that people gave, um, with all the sacrifices that Yemenis gave since two thousand and fourteen, um, and now Houthis are prevailing militarily. And yes, the future is going to be the Imam Eight if the Houthis actually a, a, an even darker version of the Imam Eight if the Houthis continue to advance militarily or if um, if they rule. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, I'll be happy to uh, contribute to the discussion. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Nedwad. Well, what you're saying reminds me of a term coined by some Yemeni historians where they called it the Emmite Trinity, which was Al-Jur, Wal-Faqr, Wal-Jahl, which is hunger, disease, and illiteracy, which we are seeing coming back to Yemen, unfortunately. Uh, so moving on to the next uh, talking point, um, just thinking back in retrospect, and uh, the timing is funny because the UNGA is being held right now at the UN, and thinking back to uh, the late Mohsen al-Aini, rahmatullahi when he was physically in New York in some capacity fighting, physically fighting for the seat at the United Nations. Um, and again, Dr. Orkabi mentions uh, that despite the isolationism of the imams, at some point they had somebody who was a CIA operative or worked in the CIA in some capacity as the spokesperson for the imam. So I would love for you to touch upon that point and then pass the mic to uh, Dr. Peterson to talk about recognizing the new republic from a wider scope. Right, so uh, I, I, Hussam liked uh, the chapter that I had on Abdul Rahman Kandi. Uh, so Abdul Rahman Khan is a, is a royal was a royalist pretender from Southern California. Had a, a full name uh, Alfonso Yorba. He was actually of the Native American descent, and his pen pal was Muhammad Al Badr uh, the, when he was still Crown Prince, and he would write back and forth. And his dream was to be Postmaster General of Yemen. So he was a guy from Southern California during the 1950s who dreamt of being Postmaster General in Yemen. Very strange story. Uh, but when the revolution happens in uh, 1962 and he sees his uh, former uh, pen pal, Muhammad al-Badr, is overthrown, he gets on the first flight uh, to Yemen, renounces his American citizenship and moves to uh, the northern highlands of Yemen and uh, then joins uh, Muhammad al-Badr and his counter-revolution during the 1960s. So it was an interesting uh, piece because he also uh, wrote for Lynn Stamp Weekly, which was a... Uh, is stamp collecting uh, one of the uh, largest and, and most widely circulated stamp collecting magazine uh, in uh, in the world? And he was the Yemen correspondent for them. So some of the the best uh, battlefield recollections that happened during this period were uh, from Abdul Rahman Kandi, who was a royalist pretender, uh, who was then uh, the postmaster general for uh, Muhammad al Badr and the Mutawakkala Kingdom of Yemen. So again, a very unusual story. Uh, but spokesperson only in the extent uh, to which he uh, went to the United Nations and was uh, there as a spokesperson for the uh, human rights violations and atrocities committed by the Egyptian army during the 1960s, specifically the use of uh, poison gas and chemical weapons against Yemeni civilians uh, during the 1960s. So Abdul Rahman Kandi was uh, a spokesperson. His affiliation with the CIA was somewhat skeptic. I, I had asked uh, uh, former ambassador David Newton whether or not he was ever employed by the agency, and, and he, he claimed that that there was never actually a connection. That any connection was was only one imagined by Abdul Rahman Kandi, who felt it would give him a little more credence to claim that he was an agent. Uh, but in reality, he was just a, a very uh, eccentric and unusual individual from Southern California who spoke fluent Arabic, uh, converted to Islam, and became the unofficial spokesman for the Mutawakkala Kingdom of Yemen. So yeah, uh, Yemen has always been and continues to be a 
uh, draw uh, for very eccentric and exotic individuals who find the country to just be uh, encapsulated uh, uh, and uh, so attractive, uh, something that brings in uh, so many people from all different walks of life because Yemen has so much beauty to it, architectural beauty, historical beauty, linguistic beauty, uh, and, and that, that attracts people from, from many walks of life. And Abdul Rahman Kandi is, is certainly just one of those examples. Thank you very much. And it is also important to note that the, uh, the post stands at that point served as a huge uh, like propaganda machine that helped not only in, the, I think after he left Yemen, he went to the UAE and established the post stamp office there as well. And the post stamps at that point served as a huge mechanism for propaganda and for foreign relations. Uh, Dr. Peterson, if you could also expand on recognizing the new republic, because we know we have, you have deep research regarding that topic, please take it away. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, recognizing the new republic. So right, well, like there was like during that, that time period in the war, there was um, recognizing the new republic by the international community. It is something that we are currently seeing right now. Like I, if you Google, mm -hmm. simply Google, who is the foreign minister of Yemen, unfortunately you get to mm -hmm. Ahmed Awad bin Mubarak and Hashim Ashraf. And it is right now, unfortunately, the dominance on the ground obviously determines, you know, the, the international, like as until right now, there's still international legitimacy granted and recognition granted to the Hadi's government. But with the dominance and the advancement of the Houthis, that is slowly fading away. And like Nedwa said, if that is installed, a worse version of the MMI might, might be coming back. But that also happened during the revolution, during those eight years. Again, Mohsen al Aini was here trying to win the seat in international recognition. And the different factors and the different historical context, you know, delayed it to some certain, in a certain capacity. And if you could just expand on that a little bit. Yeah, I think the most important thing to remember about this period, and as you say, international recognition, is that it occurred in the midst of the Arab Cold War, and that brought out allegiances to one side or the other, rather than a moderated stance on what actually was going on in Yemen. And Obviously, the Republic was aligned with the Arab progressive camp, particularly with Egypt, um, and Saudi Arabia was uh, aligned with the royalists. The interesting thing about this, I think, was John Kennedy's recognition of Yemen, which was an attempt to um, recognize realities on the ground in many ways. Uh, which then um, um, matters were, were stunted until after uh, reconciliation in 1970. In the current atmosphere, there's, there is a certain resemblance between the 1962 and the war uh, then with the war that's continuing now in that one could say superficially, it's a resurrection of that struggle between the royalists and the republicans, um, as Nadwa mentioned what the Houthis are all about. And, but there, the differences are far greater in that this is not simply one force against another, a two-way struggle, uh, even though both are supported by proxy forces or external uh, allies. It's a much more complex mix. And the reconciliation of 1970 was between these two forces in which the royalists essentially capitulated and the Republic was the dominant force. Um, and that's not going to happen today, um, partly because of the strength of the Houthis at present and partly because there are many other different actors. Um, not long ago, I gave a, a presentation on uh, Yemen in which I brought in the concept of subsidiarity 
which has been recognized by the Catholic Church and the European Union and the United Nations, in which it's it, the principle is that functions that can be contained on the local level should be carried out on that level. And the same for the regional, and that a central government therefore should confine itself to the functions that only it can carry out. And I think this has relevance to Yemen today because I think it's virtually impossible to say, have a peace settlement and everyone will be satisfied and the Republic of Yemen will be reconstituted. I think it's much more realistic to think that each of these power uh, forces will have a say in the formation and in the autonomy that they enjoy in any kind of resurrection, which will take time, um, years, maybe even decades in order to reconstruct a central government that can carry out the functions that are required of it and that also will represent the people. And uh, uh, as has been mentioned already, that the people of Yemen, I think, were represented well by the activists who, who forced the resignation of Ali Abdullah Saleh, but have not been heard from since. But there can be no real reconciliation unless they are brought back into the picture. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. And now we would like to open it up for the Q&A. And we already have the first Q&A <laughs> directed for you. Um, again, I'm tracking both the Zoom chat and also the Facebook comment section. Feel free to send in your questions, both in Arabic and English, and preferably choose one of the panelists to answer it. So the first question for you, Dr. Peterson, is that from a historical perspective, and beyond the immediate regional actors, do you see an international role played by international actors, namely the superpowers in the revolution of September 1962 at that time? And did they view any significance of that revolution in, change, in changing the lives of Yemenis or did they care at all? Well, I think the most important point here, of course, is that Egypt played a very strong role in it, and they may not have uh, fomented the revolution, but the military officers who carried it out were Egyptian trained and Egyptian influenced. And because of that, the royalists had to, to rely upon the support of Saudi Arabia and the countries that were opposed to that progressive wing of, of uh, Arab um, politics. <clears throat> Further afield, in fact, I think I should make a general point here that Yemen, unfortunately, has been, for the most part, on the fringes of international or global attention. And I think that was true in 1962, that policymakers in Western countries, for example, many of whom were forced to turn to a map to even see where the country was. And speaking, for example, of the United States and its role in that time, it was interested in Yemen as a way to counter Chinese and Russian influence. And its interest in Yemen <coughs> since, the, uh, since 1990, let's say, its interest in Yemen has been encountering Al-Qaeda and all of their interests have been subordinated to that, subordinated to the extent that they really do not carry weight. Um, in that sense, they, the international attention given to Yemen has been more destructive than not. Um, regional attention, um, for example, in this present context, present uh, combat, the roles of Saudi Arabia and Iran have been magnified, certainly that of, of Iran, perhaps not so much of Saudi Arabia, but it's seen as a struggle between those two powers and not as a struggle between the forces on the ground, that is the Yemeni factions. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. And now we have a question to uh, 
Dr. Orkabi, feel free to expand or rebuttal in, in any of the answers or the previous questions given to the other panelists that goes to all of you. Uh, the question go is, do you think that the Saudi has that Saudi has interest in bringing back the MMI system to rule Yemen as it did before 1962, given that the reason they supported the uh, MMIs in 1962 was the fear of a republic domino effect happening in the Middle East. So right now, as we stand, is there in a Saudi interest in bringing back the MMI system? And something very interesting, there's actually been a shift that was pointed out by a Yemeni researcher yesterday for the first time since the beginning of the war, Al Arabiya, which is the Saudi version of Al Jazeera, the main uh, news network, referred to the Houthis for the first time ever as Ansarullah. So is that's that's a clear shift, at least from like somebody who's being be, paying very close attention's perspective. Go ahead. Uh, well, I I don't think that the the Saudis were allied with the Imam prior to 1962. It was a happenstance of history with 70,000 Egyptian troops in in Yemen. Uh, you you needed a, a buffer zone, and I think that's what with the Saudis. It was a very expedient choice to give uh, credence or, or give an, a, some sort of allegiance and support to the deposed Muhammad al Badr. Uh, don't don't forget that the, the Saudis during the 1930s fought a war against uh, Imam Yahya and were certainly staunchly opposed to the Imamate. Uh, and the 1962, rather than the norm, was was an aberration. And the Saudis came out very much in support of the Republic after 1968 and uh, took uh, took every measure to control its politics. And so uh, any allegiance with an imamate is, is really happenstance and, and certainly uh, just uh, prudent and expedient politics. I, I don't think there's any larger plan for Saudi Arabia than ever has been uh, of controlling an imamate, but rather uh, if you look at a larger Yemeni uh, policy within Riyadh, it's in order to maintain Yemen as a weak, uh, divided state. Uh, and every moment that uh, Yemen enters a potentially centralized and strong state, Saudi policy intervenes to weaken the state further. Uh, 1962, potentially strong Yemeni state emerges and Saudi Arabia supports the opposition forces of Mohammed al-Badr. Uh, uh, Al-Hamdi, uh, one of the greatest, uh, or at least the legacy thereof, uh, one of the, the strongest uh, central figures within Yemeni uh, history uh, was opposed by uh, the Saudis. Uh, similarly, in, after 1990, uh, the threat of a centrally unified Yemeni state was a threat to Saudi Arabia, explaining Saudi policy during the 1994 Yemen North-South Civil War. Uh, and similarly, uh, and uh, many of us, um, oppose the type of government that Houthis are suggesting uh, in Sana'a, uh, but the Saudis oppose it not because uh, they're opposing it on any moral grounds, uh, but rather that the Houthis, one of the first things that uh, many of the Houthi representatives said, it, we're going to take back Asir. Uh, and uh, Yemeni territory uh, being held by Saudi Arabia for you now uh, nearly a century, uh, this is a target because this is something seen as Yemeni national identity. So we, we certainly oppose many of the uh, elements of, of Houthi leadership, but the Saudis are concerned not because of any moral misgivings, but rather they're concerned that the Houthis might form a, a strong, centrally unified state. Uh, and that's something that they're concerned about. So are the Saudis going to support the Imamate? In all likelihood, not. Uh, but if it's politically expedient at any point, they'll support uh uh, the the, the Junubi and the Southerners or the Hadramis and whoever it is in order to maintain a weak central uh, Yemeni state because that's in Saudi foreign policy interest. And, that, and that's just a real policy uh, view. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orkabi. And it's, it's, it's very interesting you mentioned that, especially towards the end of the Saudi support to any actor they've historically supported in Yemen. There's a, a book by a British who was with the Imam at the time, it's called My Mission to Yemen, where he talks about how even back then, Saudi was given the loyalists 
enough weapons to defend themselves, but not to necessarily win any real battles, which is very similar to what is going on today in Ma'rib and is the reason why somebody like Luwa, I believe it's trans Luwa translates to Lieutenant, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Muhsin Khusru, uh basically resigned because that he's like, they're not giving us any real weapons that we could win any victories with while claiming that they are our allies. Which takes me to the other question uh, directed to Nedua. Do you think that the power sharing agreement of 1962, and this is a question that has actually been repeated multiple times by multiple people, and it's a question that I myself had. Do you think that the power sharing agreement and the creation of the reconciliatory government in 1970 created the pretext of the deep state that eventually brought back the MMI with a different last name under the Houthis? I think I might uh, want to pass that question to Usher. Take a stab at it. Uh, is, you want to phrase that that question again? Um, yeah. yeah, so just so we, that, that, that I can respond to it directly in case anyone missed that question to Nadal. So, uh, did the power sharing agreement and the creation of the, rec the reconciliation government in 1970 uh, basically create these, the ground on which the neo imamites came with, like in the form of the Houthi movement with a different last name? So I, I think that we, we need to make a, with a lot of um, titles and words that are being thrown around in 1970, uh, and I think it's important to make a clear distinction here. So uh, 1970 was a, a, the official end of the, uh, the Civil War, uh, the 1960 Civil War. The Hamid Adin family goes to Kent in England, uh, some to Saudi Arabia. Uh, Gabriel von Brook uh, was an excellent uh, research scholar uh, in the UK. His research and followed many of their families as they went into exile. Uh, but the Hamid Adin family is taken out as part of this agreement. And uh, there's some form of reconciliation. Uh, Iriani being the character that he is uh, with his title as Kadi, uh, and also his respect uh, in both sides of the conflict was able to arrange a reconciliation in a way that almost nobody else could. Uh, and, and today, uh, we desperately need someone like uh, an Iriani character to, to figure out how to bring together two sides that seem diametrically opposed. Uh, but that, this is 1970s, a very different world. And this is also a consequence of uh, the um, famous siege of 1967-68, where the great majority of the uh, residents of Sana'a left, leaving behind only the more conservative elements who ultimately prevailed. Uh, Sana'a was kept under Republican control, uh, but also transferred that Republican control to uh, a much more religiously and socially conservative group. So uh, I think as Nadwa said, a lot of the uh, more socialist elements within the uh, original revolution fled to the south uh, and were, were taken out of, of power. So if, if you look at what kind of state emerges after the revolution, Nadwa said it's a failure of a revolution, and she's absolutely correct, is what the revolution sought out to do in 1962 was not the kind of state that emerged in 1970. It was a military dictatorship. That was not the intention of the revolutionaries. And it was certainly something that was co-opted uh, both by, by design, uh, but also by, uh, by circumstance following the uh, the 1967-68 uh, uh, siege uh, upon Sana'a. So uh, no, it, it wasn't an in imamate by by another name, but uh, certainly one could see as such. A, uh, I, I wouldn't. I would be hesitant to put the the imamate title on any of the Yemeni presidents. Uh, but in terms of social conservatism and and taking many of the religious tenets of uh, Shokani and bringing that into official Yemeni religious policy, that, that's certainly what did happen. So there is an element of truth there. Uh, thank you. Um, again, just to re-clarify the question further. So when the reconciliation happened, some elements of the former royalists came back from Saudi Arabia and took and were a part of the newly formed government. And so the question is, were those elements that came back and took part in the newly formed government did they eventually, like, were they creating the ground for another movement or another form of MMI to come back? Not necessarily the, the, the governments or the regimes that, the few regimes and the few assassinated presidents that ruled Yemen 
over the next 10 to 20 years until Ali Abdullah Saleh came and then lasted until 2011. But the deeps, like the former royalists coming back in being a part of the government, were they in any way, shape, or form involved in bringing back the Houthis? Um, maybe, but right. I think I don't think we should blame the loyalists for that. I mean, we've had decades of um, of uh, you know Yemen being ruled by a tyrant, by a corrupt uh, government, not cor corrupt regime uh, that's based on patronage. Um, and most of the patronage were not really former loyalists. They were, you know, they were revolutionaries or they backed the revolution back in 1962. So I don't think it's right to throw all the blame on the loyalists or the sleeper cells of the royalists. I mean, even if they come back, there was an enabling environment that one, uh, well, created a lot of grievances, but also failed to bring Yemenis together and also failed to address you know, grievances that might have emerged from the 1962 uh, revolution. Thank you. I think that is a very fair answer to, to the question and to the- If I may add. Go ahead, please. Um, I, the reconciliation in 1970, I think, was essentially a capitulation uh, on the part of the royalists because the few people they put in the government never had a prominent role, never had a really influential role. And perhaps they did shift uh, the government to being a little more conservative than it otherwise would have been. But the real factor in making that a conservative government was the siege of Sana'a and the failure of the, the more radical elements. Um, as to them being in lying in wait for their opportunity to come back, I don't really think that's the case. And as Ned was said, circumstances have changed considerably since then. And also, and I'd like to add to that question of um, would the Saudis uh, welcome or welcome working with the Houthis uh, as an imamate? No, they won't because they cannot control them. And again, as Aisher said, the, the Saudi aim ever since 1970 has been to keep a cohesive, stable Yemen, but also make sure it is too weak to challenge them. And I think that in today, uh, as well as in the past, is the essential Saudi goal. Certainly, the the corruption of the government. Sorry, is the uh, the corruption of the government, like you mentioned, absolves the what Nedwa called the sleeper cells from all the blame and uh, the the patronage of those who were at during the revolution, like huge supporters of the republic definitely like mitigates the effect of the so-called sleeper cells. And this is another question, it could be the last question directed to Nedwa. What are the lessons that we can learn from the revolution and how could, of the, how could the Yemenis protect the Republic from falling back into the hands of both corrupt elites and from going back into the MMI? Um, that's a tough question because the, the circumstances are, uh, you know, as Dr. Peterson mentioned, are different today. Um, and there are a lot of forces that are against Yemenis in general, not necessarily against the revolution, but against Yemenis uniting against, you know, the return of the MMA. Um, having said that, I think leadership is key to change. A leadership is key to um, protect Yemenis and Yemen. And right now we have a leadership vacuum. Like I said, the current government um, is not taking, it's not doing what it should do. Um, it's not taking its role seriously. Um, it's extremely corrupt and it's residing outside the country um, while Yemenis suffer. Uh, Yemeni government officials receive salaries in U.S. dollars, um, plus benefits, plus, 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 plus every month. And most Yemenis 
are without salaries for six years now. Um, and we can't just say, well, we're at war if we demand, uh, you know, to change uh, reforms. We, if we demand different leadership, then, well, you know, the Houthis are going to take over. No, this government is an enabler. It's the reason why the Houthis and others have wreaked havoc, havoc in the country over the past seven years. And so we need to get to the bottom of this. We need good leadership that represents Yemenis, that serve Yemenis, that is inside the country with the rest of Yemenis. And until that happens, it will be really hard to reverse the current situation. Thank you, Nadua. Uh, thank you, Dr. Orkabi, and thank you, Dr. Peterson. And despite all the war and chaos that is going on in Yemen, the 26th of September remains a day in a dream that every Yemeni is still holding on to as hard as we can. Uh, so with that, we are we have reached the end of our webinar, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us. We appreciate you being here. Again, a report will be sent in both languages to everybody who has subscribed to our mailing list. Safe, who is our communication director, will comment all of our social media and the website in the chat. Please follow us on Twitter and stay updated for all the upcoming webinars and we will keep you updated through the mailing list. If you guys have any closing remarks, otherwise we can end it here.